Hello, and welcome to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Ocean Science Cafe. We're here at the Flying Bridge Restaurant in Falmouth, Massachusetts, where we have a great event tonight featuring Elvin pilot Bruce Strickrot, who's going to give us an explorer's eye on the deep sea. Now, you will have plenty of time to talk with Bruce and ask questions. He's going to present for about 30 minutes, and then we will open it up for questions. If you are joining us on Facebook, just at any point, put in your question, and we have our Autumn Brown, our social media specialist, who will make sure to ask that question for you. Now to introduce tonight's speaker, Bruce. Wait a second. Sorry, one second. I, I lost my intro for him. <laughs> Bruce. <laughs> A wedding. Bruce is a certified deep submergence vehicle pilot and an ocean engineer. He has worked as a member of Woods Hole Oceanographics or Elven Group since 1996 and has made more than 300 350 dives in Elven. He holds a private pilot license and is a qualified as a PADI, Professional Association of Diving Instructors Rescue Diver. I'd like you to help me welcome Bruce Strickrod. All right, let's see if this thing's working. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me all the way in the back? Okay, so thank you, by the way. This is great, and I'm glad the audience mostly raised your hands up when you knew about Woods Hole. So I'm going to go a little deeper. How many in the audience have heard of the submarine Alvin? All right, this is great, I love this. How many of you know that it takes people inside of it? It's a submarine with people in it, right? <laughs> All right, this is good. How many of you know that there is not a tether? It's not tethered to the ship, right? This is all great. Many times when I go into audiences, you'd be surprised how many hands don't go up. So we've got the basis down, right? Now I've known Danielle, by the way. Danielle and I have been friends since 1996, right? We were junior underlings and now look at us, right? <laughs> so 24 years later, working with this submarine since I was right out of college, now I get a chance to go and speak to people about it. I love it, it's a blast. In a video that we just watched, there was a statement that said at Woods Hole, we, we work on the cusp of science and engineering, right? Well, I'm an engineer, I get to play with the toys that I build, and I get to work right on that line between science and engineering. So my whole career as an engineer, I get to work with two scientists next to me every day that I'm in the submarine. And it's this great education in science and I'm always absorbing as much of it as I can. I tell you this because I want you to understand I'm not a scientist, I'm an engineer. So a lot of the things that you see here, I, I'm mostly right, but I may not be all right. <laughs> Take that any way you want. Uh, and I'll do my best to talk about some of the science as much as I can if you have questions. So we're going to move right into this. When, when I do these talks, well, for those of you that you, you evidently know where Woods Hole is, this is a shot by Matt Barton. Where's Matt? Raise your hand, Matt. Matt took this shot. This is Woods Hole in the best time of year. I would love to see a shot of Woods Hole in the middle of December. <laughs> it won't look nearly as friendly. It'll be desolate and cold. But this is a great place to work. My office is right down on the water. I get to look at the steamship all day. And I get to work with these really great machines. And it's, I'm not going to lie to you, it's a blast. So when, when I do these, these conversations with people, and I like to treat them as conversations, I always try to ask a question so that I can learn something in the process. And as an engineer that's gotten to have a career that is exploration in nature, for this particular discussion, I said, why do we send people in the deepest parts of the ocean? Because a lot of people will ask me that question. And what I did was I tried to pick people that I know are, are, are recognized explorers, whether they explore with the, their, themselves or they do it in a, in a sort of intellectual sense. And I've thrown a few of these people who are my mentors, so to speak, and idols up to answer these questions, right? So first and foremost, we'll start with Dr. Sylvia Earle. Do you know who, who Sylvia Earle is? She's, she's amazing. 
She was the head of NOAA. I think she was the first female scientist, the head of the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Association. She's done lots of time underwater. I know her. <coughs> Ironically, she has yet to have a dive in the submarine. We'd love to work that out, by the way. Yeah. But I love what she said. She said, we need to respect the oceans and take care of them as if our lives depended on it, because they do. And I want, I've gone through these quotes and emphasized certain aspects of what they say and how they are key to what we do. So with respect to this statement, in order to learn about the ocean, you need a tool or you need a suite of tools that enable that. So that's why we have Alvin. That's why Alvin was generated back in the 60s. You'll hear me call it a submarine. I'll call it a deep submergence vehicle. You might hear me just say the word vehicle. I might say submersible. They're all the same thing, right? But can you guys see am I in your way? Ah, I'm in your way. All right, I'll hide over here. So a deep submergence vehicle is a sophisticated tool for science designed to take humans into the deep ocean. That's, that's what Alvin is. Alvin is a robot you strap on and jump into the water, down you go, right? And the human presence, by putting people in that vehicle and bringing us down to the bottom, you get a superior understanding of the harsh environments, the amazing animals, and the fantastic processes that are down there. And I've been lucky enough to, to see and experience some of those things. And there isn't a single dive that I do at all that doesn't blow me away. I'm always learning something new in there. So we'll go back a little bit. We'll do a quick history. Remember, this is... This is one of the early shots of Alvin in the water with the original support ship Lulu in the background. This is one of my favorite pictures because it's, it's clearly the 60s, it's classic. They're wearing the old rubber suits and they look, this looks like it's right out of a TV show from the 1960s. This is, imagine what these guys were experiencing back then, right? And the best part about it is, it's been going on ever since. So 1964, June 5th, just a few weeks ago, 55 years ago, Alvin was down on the pier at Woods Hole and it was commissioned by the US Navy. One thing to look at this picture is how round the vehicle is. Look at it, it doesn't have any points on it, right? It did not take them very long to figure out that you couldn't stand on it when it was round. <laughs> so in very short order, it changed. <clears throat> any of you guys heard of Alan Vine? Okay, so Alan Vine was a, was a geologist, but also an engineer, sort of self-trained, and he came up with the idea to build a vehicle that could get people to the bottom of the ocean. And there's a big backstory on this, but ultimately it was named after Alan Vine. That's how you get the acronym Alvin. And this is what he said. He said, it is very difficult to design an instrument that can be surprised. So I want you to think about that for a minute. What he really said before this was, it would be stupid to have, he, this is a quote, stupid to have only one wrench in your toolbox. What he's trying to say is you have to have the human presence because humans can be surprised by things that they see and that's how you learn new things. You can get in that vehicle and you can experience something totally remarkable that no one ever expected. You have to have people there to do that. You have to be present to be able to, to see that happen. This is the original sphere. It was built by General Mills. This is the grandson of one of the designers at General Mills. At the, this is the food company, remember? These are the, this is well known for making cereal, not so much for making submarines. The good news is they did a very good job. <laughs> this steel sphere dove for quite a while until about 1971 and was good for about 6,000 feet. So 6,000 feet back in the day in the 60s, that's as deep as they could go. And this is Lulu. For those of you who don't know, Lulu was Alan Vine's mom's name. So there's a family history built into this. This crazy contraption that was cobbled together by a bunch of Huey engineers, what you don't see is beneath each side is a tube, and that's where all the crew lived. And if you ever get a chance to talk to people who did time on Lulu, it'll blow your mind. The sub would go underneath, he, they're actually driving it in, underneath that superstructure and they'd raise it up on an elevator and it would, that's where they would work, out on the deck, that's it. If you dropped a tool, guess what? Bye bye tool. And there wasn't a lot of space on board for scientists, so they would bring another ship along, they called it the hotel boat. 
and the hotel boat would have all the great accommodations and food, and the Alvin crew would schlep it on Lulu living underwater in these tubes. They called them the twin tubes of terror. <laughs> there are t-shirts you might see with Alvin and two sperm whales on it. Now you know why those two sperm whales are there, because that's Lulu. It says Alvin Lulu, but what you didn't know <coughs> was where the people lived. This is good weather. There are some great pictures of bad weather with Lulu. And imagine trying to get the sub <coughs> underneath that arch with really heavy seas, and it's, uh, it was quite a challenge. One of the best things about the vehicle over the years is that we listen to our users, they tell us what they like and don't like, and the vehicles has changed about every five years to evolve and support these new demands. That's an image of what it would, when we finished in 2013, it's the newest version of the sub, we'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see from 64, all the way up into the 80s, 1989, all the way up into the 2000s. This is a great example of engineering design evolving. And it's really nice to watch the sub evolve. We get to be a part of it. We have meetings on tables like this where we brainstorm about what we don't like. And then we come up with ideas on how to make the thing do more cool, fun things. And how to convince people to come and use this more. Everybody knows Captain Cousteau, right? This guy's the man, right? Look at that picture. <laughs> he has a lot of quotes. It was really hard to pick one, and I, I picked this one. He's, this is what he says, to enlarge the human perspective, to build on knowledge for future generations, to identify dangers and to chart the course to a better world. These are the goals of the explorer. So there's a lot I could have pulled out of this, but this is knowledge for future generations, and this feeds into the idea that we don't just leave the submarine static in design. In order to make it capable and to provide value into the future, we update the designs on a regular basis. And that's what we did in 2012. And if anybody came around and saw us when we were putting this thing together, this is what it looked like when we actually started to make a lot of progress. And we only had about three months to finish the thing. And it was chaos. And it was a blast. It was probably one of the most amazing experiences I was ever a part of. And the night before we had to pull it out of the hangar, I think you were there to take pictures. We had not finished uh, figuring out how to hang the skins on the outside of the sub on. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, three of us went down there early because there was no way we were going to roll the sub out with the skins all hanging off. And we figured out a way to get all the skins on, and when we rolled it out, it looked like it was finished. And I remember my boss, Pat Hickey, came up at the time. He came up to me, and he said, thank you. Because we had all this media presence as we rolled this thing out of the hangar, and it actually looked like it was finished. And it wasn't. It was close. <laughs> not quite. Next year in March, we bring the sub back, and it'll look like that for about a week, and then it'll be completely taken apart in the hangar, and we've got about a year to put it back together again and make it do more interesting things. One of the big things that we did in 2012 was we put a brand new personal sphere on. This was a heck of a project. It took many years. This is in about, I think this is 2010. They had taken the ingots of titanium They'd gone back and forth across the country. They ended up in Wisconsin in the shape of a disc. And what you're going to see is how you take a titanium slab and you turn it into half a sphere. And this is remarkable because I want to remind you, where does titanium come from? Meteor. Well, there, that's great. It comes from meteors. He's probably, I just say it comes out of the earth. <laughs> so now this is even better, right? Now my story is even better. I was saying you take a shovel, <laughs> you dig a hole, you find a rock. And bada-bing, you do some magic, and you can get a submarine out of it, right? Now he's telling me that I could tell people, there was a meteor once. <laughs> We're riding to the bottom of the ocean in a meteor. That's, who's cooler than that, right? That's <laughs> awesome. Is it true? I don't know. <laughs> I'm running with it, man. That's great. So here you go. This is the meteor reheated. Now, it took months of work to get it to this stage, and, and only a few minutes to heat it. And you only get one shot to press it into a sphere and get it right. It's amazing, right? This is metal, acting like plastic, superheated. And this is real time, so this is exactly how, how long it took. And there it is. And they pull it out, it's this giant glowing goblet of titanium. And there's a 
great machines that they used to cart them around this big foundry. What is not in this video is that that first one, they dropped it about halfway across and it rang like a bell, <laughs> big gong, and everybody was, oh, it didn't just happen. And the good news is it handled it. And eventually it was machined and welded and it turned into the sphere that we have today. There's a great picture of it when you walked in. Uh, the final product is one of the most perfect spheres ever made. We're very happy about that. So now we've taken that metal ball and on the inside, all of the pilots and all the engineering, we we're all friends and colleagues. We sat down and we looked at what the old vehicle's interior was like and we brainstormed on what we wanted to build on the new one. And needless to say, we all had differing ideas, but ultimately we were able to come to, to some kind of consensus and we built this. And for those of you that had ever seen the old sub, it's a significant improvement. There's, a, there's many more windows that you can use, but the whole interior is active and each one of those screens that you see is an interactive touch screen where you can, you can communicate and command a lot of the things that are going on outside the sub. You fly it a lot like a underwater dirigible. But this is, you can see them. There's actually two people inside there with, with, uh, with our friend. This is Jefferson Growl, the pilot. And you're in the upper left of the cabin looking down toward the front. It's cozy. It's quite fun in there. When you hear people say it's cold and your teeth chatter, that's, that's not true. It gets cool. It's one of the most, it's one of the best experiences. Have you had a dive? Well, you got to get a dive. I would give everyone a dive if I could. Unfortunately, it's just too hard. This is the ship that we work off of, the RV Atlantis. You saw Lulu in 1982. Lulu was retired and the Atlantis II came along and that took uh, Alvin from 1982 all the way through 1996. And in 96 it was retired and the Atlantis was delivered in March of 1997. The great fanfare, March on the pier in Woods Hole is a miserable time to be in a Navy band welcoming a new Navy science ship because <laughs> it was miserable and cold and windy and I was out there because I was excited and I saw these poor people trying to play music in this really nasty weather and I felt for them. This is the newest Atlantis. It is uh, an active, amazing ship. I call it the flagship of deep sea research because it can do, it can run the Jason RV, Sentry, the AUV, Alvin operates off of it. It's a platform for scientific research. When we're not in the water at night, it's doing science all night long, 24 hour operations, great food, great place to go out and spend time on. And uh, it's headed into its midlife refit next year, and it'll come back out in 2021 and take us out when we go back out to sea again. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what it's like to dive and places we go and things like that. So it's a journey into the deep. Every time I take someone new in the sub, they are excited. We talk to them the night before about what their plans are. And you can see they, they've never had the experience. They've been in there to train, but they've never been underwater in it. And you can just sense how jazzed they are. And it's a really great experience to take someone new, bring them down to where they've been doing their research, turn the lights on and watch them because it changes them. It happens in a second. And uh, some data on what, what happens in there. First of all, three lucky people. Everybody that gets a chance to dive in the sub is lucky. The pilot and two observers, every time we get in there, we. We feel really lucky to have the experience. We can go down to about 2.8 miles today. And in 2021, we'll take it down to about 4.1 miles. We already have the location in the middle of the Atlantic picked. It's this tiny little squib of the bottom ocean target. And it's at 6,450 meters. It's probably the deepest part in the northern middle Atlantic. And we're going to go plant our little flag in there and be like, woohoo. 6,500 meters. <laughs> I like to tell people that, but the real big day for us will be the day that we go to 4,501 meters. We are a Navy submarine. We're not allowed to go any deeper. They, they would be really, they'd be a little bit angry if we went deeper. So I can imagine the first day we're going to be kind of like looking around to make sure no one's watching when we kind of sneak over 4,500 meters. And then we'll go to 5,000 and 55, 6,000. And then on this final day, We'll take it to 6,500 meters. 
nine to 12 hours on average. And we do nine now. When we dive to 65, we've got to figure out how to do 12 hours. And we dive every day. So we're sitting here thinking to ourselves, how are you going to dive every day, 12 hours a day? And we're going to do it. We just haven't quite figured out how to manage the people and the fatigue and the time and everything. But it's very doable. Sunlight goes away at 200 meters. So within five minutes, you don't see anything outside except for the bioluminescence as you pass through the animals. And there are places on the planet when you dive, there's so much nutrient in the water that the bioluminescence is phenomenal. And what we like to do there is flash the lights and what, what happens is it excites the animals away from the vehicle and you can get this depth perception and it's like falling through a, a field of stars and it's amazing and everyone's glued to their windows and it's not even part of your science, it's just that. You're kind of like, this is amazing, look at that, it's really cool. We pass through colors between zero and 150 meters that you cannot describe because you'll never see them anywhere else. We'll pass through a color of aquamarine that if, it, if you could put it on a gem, you, you'd sell it like crazy. It's this amazing green. We pass through a color of blue that is phenomenal. And it's all because the light gets attenuated as it goes through the water. And you just can't find that color anywhere else. And you can't even describe it. You just see it. The water's really clear and you're like, quick, look out the window. And then lunch is quite elegant. Peanut butter and jelly <laughs> every day except for when we have people who have peanut allergies, which is always good to tell us. <laughs> it happens. Candy bar, an apple or an orange, and a pot of coffee that goes with this. We're in there for nine hours. There's no bathroom of any significance. <laughs> and we challenge ourselves with a good old thermos of coffee. So Amelia Earhart, so she doesn't have anything to do with going under the water, but she certainly had everything to do with doing crazy, amazing things at the time that she was doing them. And I like what she says here. The more that one does and sees and feels, the more one is able to do and the more genuine may be one's appreciation of fundamental things. So part of the reason we take people to the bottom of the ocean is to learn about the fundamentals of what goes on in the planet, around the planet. And you can't help but appreciate them when you're down there looking out the window, staring at them. So what do we see? Where do we go? This image is one of our science observers from 2014 after we got the new vehicle out. And the great thing about the new sub is you can put the scientists in the front seat and you can hop over to the right and you can let them fly while you look out the window and make sure you don't crash into anything. She got to sit and pilot the sub for over an hour and a half. And I promise you, if you ask her what she thought of that day. She had a ball. She, we did her work. We had a little bit of extra time and we just said, hey, you want to have fun? And she just drove around the bottom and couldn't get the smile off her face. So 8 o'clock in the morning, our crew starts at about 5 a.m. to get ready to do this. Takes us three hours of prep work every day and off we are at 8 o'clock. We try to do this like clockwork so we can get as much time on the bottom as possible. So 8 a.m. we're in the water. Five minutes later, assuming everything checks out, we're on our way down. And like I said, five minutes later, you can't even see any light. All right, so we're going to start this up. I hope you can see this. Uh, about a year ago in August, we brought a camera down and stuck it on a thing we call an elevator. It's a device we throw over the side by itself, and it landed. We knew where it was. We put a GoPro in a housing that was filming from the moment it left the surface. And our plan was to go over and work this elevator device. And we just hoped that the camera was working and we hoped that we could be pointing at it. It turns out it was pointed exactly at the sub as we came in. And I have 20 minutes of video where you see this tiny little speck of light. And as you watch the video, it grows into the submarine as it comes right into the view. And I took some of the video and I put it together real quick. And I hope you can see this. If you can't see it, um, I'll probably share it with you to find a way to put it online. But it's a really good way to see, if you were a fish down there looking, or an octopus looking at the sub, this is what you'd see. We're about two meters off the bottom here. This is a muddy bottom, so we were going real slow, real easy to kick all that mud up. 
we don't jet around like a spaceship. We're pretty, we, we go nice and slow for many good reasons. In this particular place, watch what happens when I pick this up. Pick it up, you get all the cloud coming up. And it doesn't take, doesn't take much time before you get this big cloud around you. What we're doing in this image, we're picking up pieces of wood and bone that were put down a year before and we're bringing them up in boxes so the scientists can see what happened to them after spending a year on the bottom. It's just like being in an underwater blimp. So you're just cruising around nice and... Could you see that? Did everybody kind of see it? Okay, so other, other places that we go. Linear volcanoes of the mid-ocean ridges. Have you heard, you, you understand what the mid-ocean ridges are, more or less? There's a mountain range that runs down the middle of every ocean, and it's where the brand new material is formed and spreads away and gets older as it gets closer to the coast. It's the largest single feature on the planet. This map was developed by Marie Tharp and Bruce Heason from Lamont Doherty back in the 40s and 50s with data that was collected by Alvine and his colleagues who were throwing explosives over the side of a ship. So you're a scientist and this is what you're going to do, right? Take a bomb, throw it over the side, and listen to the sound waves and measure the depth of the ocean. They took all that information and put together this amazing map. You all know who Bob Ballard is, right? Bob Ballard, the, right? So he has a great quote. I didn't put it in here, but I'll tell you what he said. He said that the first time we visited the mid-ocean ridge, the largest feature on our planet, was after men had walked on the moon. So he made the point that we went to the moon, we played golf on the moon, and we hadn't even visited the largest feature on our own planet. I think that's a pretty remarkable thing. Sir Arthur C. Clarke, he's the author of 2001 A Space Odyssey, among other amazing fiction and nonfiction books. I love this quote, how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it is quite clearly ocean. I think this is important, right? We stand on the edge right here of an ocean planet and we like to believe that it's a land planet, but the fact of the matter is it isn't. And most of the ocean planet, we don't even know. We, you know, what did Rumsfeld say? We, the unknown unknowns. There's a whole map of places that no one's ever even talked about. And who knows what's down there, right? The middle of the East Pacific rise is a place we dive at. It's very hard to describe it to people, but one of our scientists was an artist and drew what it's like to be at the area that we work. So you are looking at the plate boundary. It's a linear volcano. This goes on for thousands of miles. It's actively volcanic. There's lots of hot smokers down there. It erupts about every 10 years and it does so violently. We go back to these places and everything that we put down there and everything that we thought we knew is gone. Totally 100% covered with new lava. And when you get down there on these dives for the first time, it's spooky because you're thinking, I was only down here six months ago and at any given moment it could happen again. So we remind all of our people that when we're down there, we're in an active volcano in a submarine at the bottom of the ocean Maybe we want to make sure that we're ready in case something crazy happens, like, oh, an eruption, which happens every 10 years. In this picture, what you see is how we start our day. We land on the edge of this chasm, and we fly down in it like Luke Skywalker, and we jet down the middle of the thing, and then we land at these various smokers, and we do our samples. And one of the best dives to do is when someone wants to characterize this feature, and we get to turn all the lights on and fly down the middle of it and just take video, and it's, it's a striking place to go not very big, it's not much wider than this room. And what you see in the front is what's called a sheet flow, a ropey sheet flow. Those are generated when lava is flowing very quickly. And the other thing that happens, this is a pillar in the front here. And those pillars form when the lava, liquid lava, fills that whole place up. So you have to imagine we would arrive to a lake of molten rock that eventually recedes and it leaves this crazy feature. Jason, the ROV, has great video online when they were at an active volcano on the bottom of the ocean, and the geologists there were loving it because if you take a piece of rebar and you jam it into this hot magma, you have a time zero sample, which you then get to take to the surface. That's beautiful. But it could happen at any day when we're down there. The good news with us is it hasn't, <laughs> but we're ready. 
Here's the life that's down there. This is one of the places I told you about, Tuborn Pillar. We had visited it numerous times over a period of about 10 years, and then one time we went back, it was gone. This is about 40 meters tall, covered with these tube worms from top to bottom. And in every square meter, there's tons and tons of life. So this is, you're parked right up next to the thing. There's thousands of animals. If you got even closer, each animal is a community of thousands of animals. And the whole time you're there, crabs climb their way up to the top of this 130 foot tall structure. And eventually, I, I think they do it for fun, they parachute off. So the whole time you're there, <laughs> you have crabs parachuting down. Tim Shank is a scientist at Woods Hole who studies, he's a biologist, he studies these animals. He's one of my best friends. I've taken him there a number of times. We parked in front of the thing, and everybody's in there looking out the window, blown away. We we're all, if you listen to the audio, we're all like, wow, this is amazing. It's not the first time we've been there. It's gone. We went back one day, and it's just, shoop. the only thing that was left were the tube worm casings, and you could follow them and follow which way the lava took their carcasses. The good news is they grow back. This is the middle of the Atlantic Ocean along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is similar to the Mid-Pacific Ridge. This is a site that's a significantly different. So we're, we were working up on this big seamount called the Atlantis Massif. We were up at the top. We had a camera in at night. We were taking pictures looking for rocks that were mantle rocks, rocks that are typically below the surface that had been exposed. And we had a team of geologists on board. And in the middle of the night, one of our uh, Jason engineers, Jim Varnum, saw an image come up and he said, that's different. And boy, was he right. And the next day we dove down all the way at the top, right along that ridge on the left-hand side is where we were. And we turned the lights on and we came across this. Now this is an artist's depiction of it because you can't get an image of it. This is an 80 meter tall structure 50 meters, maybe about that height. It's bright white. It comes off of the wall at the top of the seamount, and it's venting water. And this is nowhere near where there's active volcanism. This is up on the top of a seamount that's off the mid, ri mid ridge. Imagine being on a ship full of geologists who stumble across a geologic feature that no one has ever seen. They were giddy. Right? It was amazing. And, and immediately, all that other research we were going to do on a cruise, <laughs> see ya. Right, boom, right. Next thing you know, we're all over this thing. No one even knows what to call it. So right off the bat, people's careers changed. It happened in a second. It was amazing to observe. And they came up with the, uh, this is called Lost City. It's a whole field of these things. It's the only one they've ever found because it's the only one they've ever looked for. I guarantee you there's more like these out there. They just haven't had a chance to go hunt for them. I could be wrong about that. They might have found a few since then, but nothing as astounding as this. Clive Cussler, you guys know the writer, the author Clive Cussler, he wrote a book called Lost City. It's great, <laughs> right? Because he takes the premise of Lost City and the next thing you know, he, it's the elixir of immortality. It involves the Rothschilds. Alvin's in there and there's another submarine that grabs it and steals it. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> we took that book and we signed it, everyone that was on the cruise, and we gave it to the chief scientist from the cruise, Deb Kelly. And she still has this signed, autographed copy of that book because she's the one who found it and she's the one who got to name it. The Gulf of Mexico, I think a lot of us took it for granted until recently. It's a place we sort of know about. There's a lot of rigs out there and we drill for oil and there's gas. The Gulf of Mexico is one of the most amazing places I've ever been to. And I was the same thing. I was like, yeah, big whoop, Gulf of Mexico, right? Every couple million years, the, the Florida Peninsula and the Isthmus on Mexico close and the sea dries up many millions of years. It becomes a big salt flat. And then after a period of time, the water comes back in after it's got layers of sediment on top from, from terrestrial. Water gets back in there and all that salt underneath comes up in a brine liquid and it fills the basins in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico and it makes lakes and ponds on the bottom of the ocean. And what you're gonna see here in a minute is what that looks like when you're on a lake in a submarine on the bottom of the ocean, right? You gotta think that through. You're in the ocean on a lake. I put Carl Sagan, he's one of my heroes, and I think it's appropriate to think about this with respect to the Gulf of Mexico, right? We do a lot of things in the Gulf of Mexico, and there's a lot of knowledge about the Gulf of Mexico, but do we truly understand it from the bigger picture, right? We're in a very bad, We've been in very bad trouble if we don't understand the planet we are trying to save. 
I really like that comment, right? We need to get to know the place we live on. It seems like it's a no-brainer, right? So here we are. We are hovering over a brine pool. This is down about 2,500 meters. We've got the sub neutrally buoyant. We're about a meter above this thing. We've never touched it. It looks like the surface of the planet Jupiter, but what you're really looking at is a mixture of uh, elemental sulfur and bacteria, this is what I've been told, that are on the top of the liquid brine. And beneath that, we're not sure how deep this one is. Some of them are only a few feet deep. There's a brine basin that is 300 meters deep. And we have tried to get the sub into that liquid by putting all sorts of weight on it, and we can't get any deeper than, we, we, there's a finite limit. Every time we try to dive there, we always get to the same spot. And we don't drop any weights to slow down as we arrive, which is completely counter to what we normally do, right? So you come blistering into this, and you can see the bottom coming up, and then all of a sudden you just stop. Like you just landed on jello. You can't even feel it. You just, yoop. And then you're kind of baffled by this, because if you haven't shed any ballast, you were going really fast, and next thing you know, you're just kind of parked on this really dense brine liquid. And it's an amazing place to visit, but we, we just can't get any deeper. So what you're going to see here is what it looks like to make a wave on a lake on the bottom of the ocean. So we've taken the sub and we've parked it in one of these brine lakes and it actually makes a wave that rolls up on a beach. And what's really great about going to these places is the moment that you get there with scientists that are trying to describe it, they immediately forget that they're underwater and they start talking like they're in air. Like you can listen to the transcript and say, we were in the air above the lake and you have to nudge them and go, well, not really. You were, you were on the bottom of the ocean. It, it's funny, but at the same time, it's profound because it shows you how the human mind works, right? Here we go. This is real. Giant clam. This is a, you, you're going to see the name of it. It's called Calyptogena magnifica. These are clams that evolved from shallow water clams and made their way down in the deep water. And they are that big. And what you don't know is that their red blood inside has got hemoglobin and they're full of sulfur because they use sulfur in the bacteria to feed them and they stink. So if you bring the, when you bring these on board the ship and they put them in the lab, the whole, the whole ship starts to smell like rotten eggs. Um, this is how they lived. So this is relatively new rock. You can tell by the color, it's black and shiny. And there is warm water just beneath the surface that's coming out of these cracks. And the clams wedge their little feet down in there. They stick their clam foot down into the water and they absorb the water with all this chemical nutrients into their foot. So they have, they have a stomach, they don't use it. They just say, we don't need that. And they use their foot. And they absorb the water, they feed their bacteria in their gills and the bacteria feed the clam. And they're really fun to pick up. You can't, there's no other way to get them than to pick the robotic arm up and pick them up. And there's a very finite range of where you go from, you can't pick the darn thing up and it slips out every time to, oh no, we just crushed a clam. And what you don't see is that the one creature that benefits from Alvin's inability to collect these clams are the crabs. And it only takes one clam before you have all the crabs marching over. And, they, it, and it's not unusual to be trying to put clams in the bio box and have all these crabs trying to climb in with you and you kind of get out of here. So the tube worms we saw the other day, this is footage from the same place, not the tube worm pillar, but right basically where it was. Uh, this is what it's like to be parked right at one of these sites, taking a look out the front. All of these animals, the, the big tube worms, the riftia, the giant ones, they only look like they're a foot long. If you pull them out, they're about four to five to six feet long, so they're really hard to put into a box. They come out of larval stage and they pick a place and they're stuck there. So. If the water source goes away, the riptia suffer. The muscles can move. There was a scientist who said, let's see what the muscles do when you take them and you move them away from where they like to be, which is in the warm water, and you put a camera on them and watch what they do. Well, what do you think they do? They like, and then off they march back to where the warm water is. And it's this great time-lapse video of about 50 muscles, and they kind of uniformly line up, and they're like, all right, we're not staying here, we're going back to where the bath is, and they go back to where they can live and feed. Mussels can feed both on the warm water they can feed normally, so they're pretty ingenious, and they're the ones, they come in last.
So rift you show up first, clams are coming in, and then the muscles kind of come in and take over everything. Sorry, this was supposed to be playing. Did it play? Yeah. Okay, good. These are Zoarsa. These guys hang out. They look really docile. You think you could get one until you try, and then they teleport. <laughs> so they don't move unless they have to, but when they do, they go really, really quickly. All right, has anybody ever seen one of these? I have one in my office in a bucket. <laughs> these things are great. I, I want to get into a jar. This is a giant isopod. They're in the Gulf of Mexico, among other places. They are one of the coolest things I've ever seen. If you were unlucky enough to have the demise in the Gulf of Mexico, probably in short order, they would arrive and devour you, and they do it very quickly. We went down with big chunks of rotten, stinky tuna, the goal to bring the big sharks in that, that scavenge, and they showed up fast, within minutes. It was just, there they were, and they covered this. We're like, get away, this is for the sharks. They are a cross, in my opinion, between a pill bug or a roach, uh, a praying mantis, and an alien being. And these things are, they're just, I, ha I want to put it in a jar, because I guarantee you, they're, they're so hideous. You take it into a classroom and you park it there, and everyone runs. What you don't know is it was alive. When we picked it up to the surface, you're holding this thing and it's still squirming. Yeti crabs, anybody who's seen the Yeti crab? Oh, this is great. So this is another example of where you find things you never expected to find. We were down working in an area in the Southern Pacific and these little crabs, they can sense methane gas coming out of the water. They can sense elemental methane that's inside, it's dissolved in the water and they live on that by farming bacteria in their hairy arms. And the whole time we were down there, they group up and they have this little Yeti dance. If you go on to YouTube, there's the great Yeti dance and they put music and they're all waving their arms in the methane saturated water. And the Alvin pilots, Anthony, a good friend of mine, Gavin and myself, we were seeing these things and we were like, hey, that's different. You should get that, you should get that. They finally did. And next thing you know, it's on the cover of Time Magazine. We're like, yeah, <laughs> nice discovery. <laughs> but the cool thing was, once again, you're down there, you're looking at things you think you know, and they pop up, and they become a sensation, and you gotta give the person who named them credit, right? If you just called it some random Latin name, people would be bored. But the Yeti crab, that, that's got some, you know, some cred to it, right? Do you guys know what a Yeti is? All right, the Yeti's the mythical creature that runs through the Arctic and probably has a reindeer or two, I don't know. And this picture, so this, I like this picture partly because I got lucky and I took this. And there's a story associated with it. So we are in the brine pool again. This is the same one that you saw in the wave video. And there's lots of animals that are in the mixing layer that don't make it because of the change in the, the salinity. And this octopus came to us, which is totally unusual, and we stuck the, cr the claw out. And she climbed on board, and I took this picture, lucky shot, it's gone, it's a pretty popular picture. What most people don't know is that sitting next to me on the right hand side of the sub was this guy, Jeremy Potter. He's a scientist and a journalist. And this is the picture I took of him <laughs> looking out the window at the pink octopus. And I've got to get it morphed together because I, they've got to be, they're like brothers from a different, <laughs> they are, look at them, right? They're totally, and he knows this, right? He loves this picture because I, I, when I saw it, I'm like, man, I got to get this shot. This is a one-time chance. It's, it's like, nice to see you. <laughs> but that's, a, so there's part of the fun. So we find a new species of octopus. Unfortunately, we bring it to the surface and it goes to the Field Museum in Chicago. And we get a chance to, to kind of have a little fun with the experience. And I can call Jeremy any day and he remembers this. Okay, now we're back out in the Pacific. We're off the coast of Santa Barbara. We're in about 50 meters of water. This is really shallow for us. We're diving on a, an asphalt mound. These are formed naturally from the oil that comes up out of the bottom of the ocean. There's a lot of people off the coast of California who complain about tar balls, and they make the assumption they're coming out of something man-made. In this case, they're not. There's a huge mound of tar out there. Everything you see in this video that is, looks like rock is tar you can bring a chunk of it up to the surface and let it dry and you can light it on fire. And these animals, 
which are typically bigger than what you find in the deep ocean, they were living there. We came around the corner. This is Chris Reddy who was in that video. He and I are in the sub. I won't play the audio, but he was very excited. <laughs> you can tell by the words that he used. <laughs> and we discover this wolf eel. It's about five feet long, amazing animal. And it was trying to make sure we knew how tough it was. That's why its dorsal fin is up. And then its partner over here. We only had a few minutes to look at it, but this is the kind of thing we're, we're studying tar mounds. We're not studying animals, but these are beautiful animals. They're very important to the environment, and they make home down in this giant stinking pile of tar. Okay, Dr. Edwin Hubble. You guys, do you know Edwin Hubble? So he doesn't have much to do with ocean science, but he is a, a huge person. He effectively discovered the galaxy in his own way, right? He was the first person to realize there was more than one galaxy out there. He discovered that the, the stars are all moving away from, from one another, and it was a huge change in the way we look at the universe. But I like what he says. Equipped with five senses, man explores the universe and calls the adventure science. So this tells you a little bit about what science is, right? It is exploration. They're kind of one and the same. You don't divide the two away. When you're doing science, you're doing a form of exploration. And the people that I work with, again, I'm lucky. I, I'm an engineer working with scientists. They are so dedicated in what they do. They, they don't like not knowing things. And they were driven to figure these things out. And I like this because it emphasizes the fact that you need to use your five senses to really understand things. So a few other places, and we're almost done here. Other interesting destinations we go to. This is the skeleton of a whale on the bottom of the ocean. We refer to them as whale falls. So this was actually placed by a scientist. This whale rolled up on the beach, dead, this big carcass. And it was towed out. You can see the, the rope on the tail. And placed in a location off the coast of California. And then over a period of about eight years, we went back and dove on it. And we would dive on it from its initial stage of decomposing, which is pretty hideous because it's this giant rotting blubber mound with hagfish by the thousands drilling in and out of it. And then we would cut giant pieces of dead, stinking whale off, bring them to the surface, where they would promptly make everything smell bad. They would analyze them in the lab for about a day, and then they'd take them back down and place them back down there, and we'd come back a few years later. This is what it looked like probably about six years in, and we flew the sub over and took all these images and put them together to come up with this picture of what it looked like. This is what it looks like after about four years. Most of the animal has decomposed. The color of what you see there is the sulfur bacteria that has evolved to live on the hydrocarbons that are in the whale's blubber. And there's a lot of really great discoveries, like there is a particular bone worm, this is gruesome, that has evolved to live on the bones of these things. So in short order, that whale, is, there's nothing there. The only thing you can, when, if you go back to it now, is you can just look at the color of the sediment and realize that you can still see the manila rope there. But nothing goes to waste in the ocean, not at all. There's always something ready and willing to eat whatever's left over. But I'll, I'll tell you what, rotting whale blubber is not a good smell. It's, it's very bad. It's very bad. Okay, we're still in California. This is a site that we know about. We dive on it periodically to test our lights and our sonars and other things. This is an aircraft that was flying during World War II as a mail carrier, probably why it's Lucky 13. And it lost its engine and bailed into the water. The pilot survived. The plane has been there ever since. It's in remarkably great shape. Uh, most of the aircraft is covered with metal except for the rear end of it. And the rear end is covered with life. So it's become an artificial reef down to about, it's down about 1,000 feet, so not very deep. Really fun to dive on. We don't get a chance to go and do these things very often. And I suspect most of you know about Alvin's visit to the Titanic. This is 1986. I don't talk much about Titanic because I've never visited there. I'm up for it. If anybody wants to promote the idea of going back, I'd love to go. Um, but in 1986, they went down with their first people on Titanic. It's been visited. It's turned into a bit of like Everest. There's a lot of people go there and they get their selfie and off they go, right? And I'll tell you an interesting story about that in a minute. But what I do like about this is there was an artist involved who showed what it would look like if you were in the submarine approaching this wreck. And the scale, so you're in a 23-foot submarine approaching this massive thing covered with 
entanglement hazards. Uh, two quick stories. The Russians dove on this quite often with a friend of mine who's a filmmaker. They had two submarines, and they, they didn't really care much about rules, and they drove right into the boiler room. And one, one, one of the subs went into the boiler room. I'm talking in the carcass of this thing. And the other one was stuck in the mud. So the one in the boiler room got stuck and called the other one and said, hey, come on over here, help us out. And they're like, hey, we're going to call you. We're in the mud. <laughs> and they were in there for a couple of hours before they both got out and promptly went back up to the Keldish, which was a support ship, and probably cracked open a bottle of vodka and acted like it never <laughs> happened, right? <laughs> they, they were really amazing pilots. They were really amazing submarines. They could do whatever they wanted. And I think on that particular time, Stephen Lowe is a producer, a friend of mine. He said he was ready to write, you know, assuming someone could come and get him out when they weren't there anymore, he was going to write his sort of, hear ye, hear ye, I'm stuck in the bottom of the Titanic, I wish I wasn't here. But he didn't have to. Okay, four o'clock in the afternoon, typically that's when we have to go back to the surface. This is a shot of the sub that we created by illuminating it. So normally you wouldn't, you wouldn't have this. Normally you wouldn't see the sub this well lit. But you can kind of get a sense for how it operates. And we're about ready to head up to the surface at the end of the day. And here we are, we're back up. We've been lifted out of the water. Typically it's 5.30 and it's right when dinner s happens. So we put the sub into the hangar, we get out, we run, we have our dinner, we eat in about 15 minutes. But like I said, the food is Phenomenal. We like to play this game. Can we guess what's for dinner? <laughs> We're about 20%, right? But there's typically a pattern. We always hope for pizza night. I don't know why, but there's <laughs> something about pizza. We've had peanut butter and jelly. Why not follow it with some pizza? Come on. So 5.30, we're done. By about 6, the scientists have the gear. We spend about two hours getting the sub ready then for the next day. By about 8 o'clock, we're done. And then we're back up at 5 o'clock the next morning to get ready to do it again. This is a pretty typical day for us, and we don't get days off. We do this every day. If we can get every day in the water, we'll get it in, in the water every day. So this is a good friend of mine. This is Will Sellers. I like to put him up here. Will was one of the few pilots that dove Titanic, and he loves to tell the stories about it. He left the Alvin Group and went and became one of the leads on the Jason project and was with Jason until he retired. And he likes to push my button. And for years, he would say that Alvin is an elevator for, for egos, an elevator for the human ego. And I realized he was right. And that n he was right because it's important to recognize when we transport our brain to places like the bottom of the ocean or the top of a mountain or into space, we bring every aspect of it with us. We bring our memories, our families, our egos with us. That's an important part of the experience. So. We'll try to kind of push my button saying that, you know, it's just a bunch of people having a good time, which is true, but it's critical to the experience. You can't learn things without bringing all that with you. And you have to have the, the nerve to do it. And I think that that, so Will, sorry Will, but I get to use you <laughs> as a quote. He's a really great guy and he's got great stories and he, he wrote a lot of songs about being out there. And it, what I just said leads into this. This is what I've seen on a regular basis. Diving in the submarine is a life-changing experience. These are pictures that we take typically on the way up. They're pretty uh, classic. This is what people take home and show their families. I've never taken one of these pictures without people beaming because they've just had a day that they've never had. I've taken very, very important and wealthy people down and asked them what they thought about the dive as I calculated how much money they just made in the last hour. And um, one of them said to me that there are 50 experiences in a lifetime probably that are significant and that you will remember and that his experience was one of the top 10. I get a chance to watch people fundamentally altered when you get them to the bottom and you turn the lights on and they get to see these places that they've thought about. That's an amazing honor to have, but it's also a great way to make friends. All these people are, had a great time. That's Ann Curry in the upper right. That was fun diving with her. This fellow on the lower left, that's Mike Degree. He was a filmmaker, good friend of mine. Unfortunately, he had a helicopter uh, accident and lost his life. But that guy's story is amazing. But having him in the sub and taking a picture of him on the bottom was quite fun. 
And I kind of ended on this. I, I dug around for a lot of things I thought were important. And I sort of pulled this out of it. It's not the full poem by T.S. Eliot. But basically, here's what he says. He says, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So there's a lot of ways you can think of this. The way I like to apply this is we go into the bottom of the ocean because there's a really good chance that's where our life started, or at least some life started. So we are studying places on the planet that led to the evolution of a species that understood that well enough to go back in and try to figure it out. And I think, you know, Sagan makes this point, Carl Sagan makes the point that we're just this little sliver of the universe that's become aware and has an opportunity to go reflect on that. And while you're at it, grab meteors and turn them into submarines <laughs> and go down and do really fun things. And at that, I will end and take any questions you have at all. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Bruce. Now we'll take some questions. We'll pass around the mic so everybody can hear it online as well. Start. Get that fixed. Can you hear that? How do you get on? How do you get a dive in the submarine? Is that what you're asking me? Yes. <laughs> well, the truth is it's almost exclusively for people who write a proposal and get out with a group of scientists that do the research. Um, we, there are folks within our group that come out. We hire engineers and technicians that train, and we, we train them to be pilots. Um, I would love to be able to make, uh, how about this? It'd be interesting if we could find other avenues to get people in the submarine, but because we're a Navy submarine and a Navy operated ship, there are some pretty big restrictions to that. We, we don't offer up seats for sale. I suspect that if we did, we would not have a funding problem. Hi, I would Hello? Hello. Um, I was wondering how you got the Alvin to the Pacific Ocean. Did you go through the Canal, Canal or do you ship it? No. We th so this, here's what happens. The sub is actually on the ship right now in the Pacific working with the remote vehicle Jason. It's in the back. The sub stays on the ship for years. And next year we'll bring it through the Canal back to Woods Hole in March and we'll take it off. And then we'll put it back on again and off we go. It's not unusual for Atlantis to leave Woods Hole for over three years. It's not, when I first started here, we would leave Woods Hole and we wouldn't see this side of the, the, the uh, states for two and a half to three years. And uh, we'd come back for the winter and we'd tear the sub apart and then off we'd go again. So, so we keep it on the ship and we, we sail it around. That's how it gets from one. We don't like putting it on trucks. Uh, if any of you guys know that uh, James Cameron gave us a submarine and we uh, took it apart and put it together to learn all about it. We stuck it on a truck and it was headed to Connecticut to go over to Australia for, to be in a museum, and it promptly caught fire. That was a bad day. And with it, so the name of the submarine is Deep Sea Challenger, and people were immediately calling it Deep Fried Challenger, which wasn't so much <laughs> fun. The good news is it's in California, it's been rebuilt, and it's headed to a museum. But the day that it left, we were, we were grateful. We needed the space. And the next morning, I talked to Anthony Tarantino, who works with me, and he's in charge of it. And I said, isn't it great it's gone? He goes, have you seen the news? And there it was on the side of the road in Connecticut, and the whole top end of it had charred. So that wasn't such a great day. We don't like putting Alvin on a truck. Tube worms. He's wondering what tube worms eat? Tube worms. What do tube worms eat? That's a great question. So tube worms are fed by bacteria that live inside of them. So they feed the bacteria the water that's around them, and the bacteria feed them. It's, a, it's a called a symbiotic relationship, so they're partners. And I don't know whether they've quite figured out 
where the bacteria come from. But there's some stage in the life of the tube worm, it goes from larval to a tube worm, and then eventually it turns into this giant bag of millions of stinky green bacteria. So tube worms get fed. That's how they eat. It's a good question. And I'm sure there's a scientist out there who would say, well, not exactly, but. <laughs> Adam? Hello. Hello. Sorry. Uh, are um, animals hostile towards Alvin, and can it go fast if needed? Can it go fast? That's a relative thing. But the answer to your first question is, are there hostile animals? Yes. Not many, because most of them look at us, and I think they see what we saw in the video, and they're like, uh-uh, I'm out of here. Swordfish are very territorial, and there's some great images online of swordfish that have attacked the sub. One got stuck in the 60s. This is a great picture. There's a swordfish jammed into the side of the, the sub. They recovered it, and they had a great couple of days of swordfish steaks because I mean, this picture is amazing, right? But it's happened since then. Uh, a small one attacked the sub once, and it learned real quick that subs are hard, and their beaks aren't, and the front end, the front end of the sword broke off. We have video of the crabs eating what's remained. And in August of last year, we were off the coast of South Carolina, and there was a swordfish out in front of us. There's video of this online. And we were watching this fish go back and forth, and it was making a point. And I knew it was going to come. It's not unusual for them to attack us. So the thing went around us to the right-hand side, and as it did, coral, we were, we were researching these hard coral called lophelia. All of a sudden, coral came out of the, the, above the sub. We don't even know where it came from. We kind of ignored it. And the fish came around the, the left side of the sub, and I just kind of pushed it, and it took off. We have all this on video. And then after the dive, we were watching it, and we saw the swordfish bite coral and get a mouthful and then promptly spit it at us as it went around the backside to come back around. They, uh, they must think highly of their ability to... But that was the last we saw. We just gave it a little nudge, and it went away. So the answer is yes. And is the sub fast? We, the fastest that we can go, you could jog with us. And the thing to keep in mind about the sub is it's, it, it's weightless when you're, in the, when you're neutrally buoyant, but it's got 40,000 pounds of mass. So if you get it going at about three knots, it takes a while to stop it. It's an elephant on roller skates. So once you get an elephant on roller skates moving, it takes a lot to get an elephant on roller skates stopping. So we can, we can jet along, but it, fast is relative. You see the movies where they're flying through the water like, you know, it doesn't, it's not real. What do you have for batteries? This is another good question. What do we have for batteries? So the sub is an electric vehicle and it runs off batteries and the batteries that we currently use are the same as what you have in your car, only bigger. They're huge. This is going to happen for the next probably four or five years and then we're going to try to move over to the kind of technology that you have in your cell phones. There's a lot of risk with that because we all know what happens to cell phones. It tends to happen to people in airports for some reason. I don't know why. But uh, that's where we're headed. And then the idea of spending 12 hours on the bottom is going to get interesting because there's a good chance we could spend 14 hours on the bottom or 24 on the bottom. So big, heavy lead acid batteries, just like you have in your car. It's old tech. We've got two questions uh, from social media. One, why do you say that HOV Alvin flies um, if it's underwater? And also, have you ever been scared while you were diving in HOV Alvin? And if so, why were you scared? All right, so the, the answer for the first question, why do we say that it flies? I think the answer is because when I got started, all the other pilots called themselves pilots and talked about flying. And I think it's probably bigger than that. It's about the fact that you're above the bottom and you're moving along over it. So we fly like a blimp. There's a great joke. It's been around a lot longer than me. It says, how do you know if there's an Alvin pilot in the room? Do you know the answer? Don't worry, he'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> great joke, huh? Well, we, we have one female pilot. We're actually looking for people now. We'd like to have to change that joke to She'll let you know. Um, the point is, I don't know the answer to that. We, we think of it a lot differently than you would uh, any other kind of vehicle. And have I, ever been, have I ever been scared? The answer is no, I haven't. We spend hours and hours of work making sure the vehicle is safe. We don't get to pilot the sub until we spend about two years getting to know it. 
And I mean, we have to know it down to the point where you can draw all the schematics from memory. I used to sleep with the schematic above me. I could see it in my mind, it's burned in. You have to know all the procedures. We're involved in writing them. I've never been in a situation that was significant enough to be afraid. I've had a few moments that are frustrating and I've had plenty of dives I've had to end for minor problems. But I hope to keep it that way. Actually, the, the only time I've ever been, been afraid is when I broke something and I knew I was going to have to tell someone when I got to the surface <laughs> and that I was probably going to make other people stay up all night trying to fix what I had done. So I don't know if that counts. How deep can the Alvin go? How deep can it go? So if I was at a place today to take it on the bottom, I could take it down to a little over 14,000 feet. So if, have you ever been out west to Mount Rainier near Seattle? If you go online, look up Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier is 14,410 feet tall. So we can currently dive about as deep as Mount Rainier is tall. And in about a year, we'll be able to dive as deep as Mount McKinley, the tallest mountain in North America, is 22,000 feet. So we're going to upgrade from Mount Rainier to Mount McKinley. And that'll be a pretty interesting day. So we're looking at 22,000 feet. Is there any more questions? Oh. I was just wondering, is this on? I was just wondering um, if any. Um, thoughts have been put into uh, either probing or getting the Alvin to somehow submerge those uh, deep salt lakes, the dense uh, salt lakes at the bottom of the ocean? So it's a good question. So can we get deeper in them? The answer is you probably cannot. I think there's probably, there, there's a physical, in order to maintain the sub's capability to come back to the surface with the, the, the buoyant forces, you can't overcome the density difference in the brine. So what we do is we sit on it like a, you know, a little water, water spider on the surface and we lower these snorkels down into the brine and we build these pretty spectacular pumps that will suck that brine up from about 100 meters down and they bring it to the surface and study it. But we've tried, we've put more weight on that sub than I've ever seen. And like I said, you arrive at the bottom, you're 100 meters off and you're coming in really fast and it, everything in your mind is slow down, slow down, slow down and you don't. And you just, you're like, please don't hit. And then all of a sudden you just, and you just stop. So we've tried. The crazy thing is, when we went back and looked at the very first dives in the same location, we stumbled across their depth and we hit it exactly the same. And we also came across this note that said there's a dead crab there, and then a minute later it said the dead crab was reanimated. So we promptly were calling this the Valley of the Zombie Crabs. And you can actually, <laughs> if you look in our log, we could say it's like, back at the zombie crab, it like <laughs> says that in there. So there's a lot of comedy in the sub. Hi. Um, I wanted to know what was your favorite memory down there, and also did it change the way you see the, like the Earth down like up here? Well, the answer to the first one is I don't know yet, because there's too many to list. I mean, I can remember my first dive, and that was just an experience because I was in there and I was seeing things for the first time. We were diving in mud off Bermuda, but I'll never forget it. And then I've been to places like uh, there's a site called Pedo Deep, and it's down in the Southern Pacific. And it's a scar where the bottom has torn itself open. And it's, thousand, it's a thousand, four, three or 4,000 meters tall and kilometers wide. It's a wall down in the middle of the bottom of the ocean. If it was on land, it would be a national park. People would climb it. And we're on a submarine diving on this wall and picking up rocks. And periodically, we'd come up and we'd have a ledge over us with a rock as big as a house. And Pat Hickey, who was the, the guy around the show, would refer to them as Wile E. Coyote Rocks. <laughs> and we'd come up and we'd see these things, they'd be great images, and know that that was right above us. So those are areas that are that they're just, the, the scale of some of the places we visit is astounding. And those are amazing. And then, like I said, I think the best experience is watching people get down there. Has it changed my view of the planet? It's altered my life. I, it can't not, right? I used to look at the ocean and say, okay, ocean, probably flat, sandy bottom, right? It isn't like that. There's a lot of that out there, but there's a lot of it that isn't. That's why I do this, by the way, because I know what it's like to be down there, and I wish I could take everybody down there. And I'm not just talking about looking at it on a screen. That's a great way to experience it. 
But until you're in there looking out the window and you're like, there's three of you and you're sitting there collaborating and everybody, it, the day goes by like that and then you come back up and you're sitting at dinner and you're having this sort of recollection of the, ch of the experience. So yeah, it changes you dramatically. But it can't not. I mean, it's, if anybody goes in there and comes back like, meh. <laughs> okay, we have time for two more questions. Let me see. I'm interested in knowing um, if something goes wrong and you're really deep, I'm, what is the emergency plan? Well, I mean, everybody wants to believe, you know, what happens if it leaks? Well, if it leaked, it doesn't leak, that would be not a problem that we could fix. But the good news is that it does not leak. So the biggest problem I think that we are aware of would be entanglement and getting stuck on the bottom. And that's a pretty significant one because there's a lot of trash on the bottom and you have to keep your eyes open for things that would get you stuck. The good news is we've designed the sub to have pieces that we can jettison. So we can knock off thrusters and the arms can come off and the basket on the front end. And we can pitch those two big batteries that we talked about. So that's just one example. And the, the, the systems that allow that they have multiple redundancies. So any particular, like for instance, if the arm got stuck, we can jettison the arm. There are four ways to do that supplied from multiple different places. Every one of those has to work and it's tested every morning. We have this massive suite of things that we can do. Then the other thing is, is we train and we train a lot and we train not to go places that we think could be a problem. And it's really normal to be in a place with scientists drooling because there's a tube worm in there they really want. And they're trying to get you to go into a place that you know you probably shouldn't. And they'll use phrases like, well, so-and-so would have gone there. Why won't you, right? <laughs> and the answer to that is it doesn't matter because if your gut feeling says don't go there, you don't. And the reason is that nine times out of 10, if you just kind of move around on the other side where it's safe, there's more of those really whiz-bang tube worms. So it's a combination of design experience and then it's also training but it doesn't mean we don't we don't know everything that's out there that could cause us harm so we're always reevaluating and we have discussions we'll sit around and talk about what would happen and we put our pilot trainees through some pretty rigorous drills and we don't let them become pilots until we're confident that if they were down there in that kind of situation they would know what to do and the other good news is that we don't have to be in a rush We've got over four days of life support. So if you get into a situation, you can talk to the surface, and you've got a couple of days of time to think your way through it. And we also have vehicles on board the ship to help us. So we don't, we have not gotten into those situations very often. Uh, you can look up some of the history. They've been stuck on the bottom a few times. The good news is they didn't stay there. Uh, I have not. I don't plan to be. I don't want to be the one with two people next to me going, nice. <laughs> nice work. You've mentioned that you dive in areas that are changing constantly. Uh, how do you advance, plan, or navigate when you're going into those areas where it may be totally different from the last time you were there? Well, th this is a good question. So we, first of all, we assume nothing. And when we arrive, the ship is a big platform with a sonar on it. So if we have any questions, we can do things like map it with the sonar and send a device down to measure the water and get the temperature. So it just so happens that when we dove on the one site that had had an eruption, we found out about it because the previous visit, we had put these devices down that were measuring the, the plate movement. And another ship came on about a year later and tried to call them back up. We were supposed to arrive back up with an acoustic signal. Most of them did not. Let me use, oh, there it is. Most of them didn't even talk. So they said, okay, something big has happened. And they went down there and they, they saw a temperature anomaly. And then they called us up and said, you want to go and check it out? And we said, yeah, we do. And we found these, these devices. There's a picture of one in Geographic that was completely covered with lava, totally, except for one little square where a little flag was sticking up. And it could still talk to the surface. We found this thing. We, we got this great video, and it's this device buried in lava. So what do we do? We, we do our best to get as much information as possible, but we never assume anything, particularly as we arrive at the bottom. If we don't have knowledge of what's on the bottom, we come in slow, and we'll turn the lights on, and we'll search around. 
But nowadays, there's an awful lot of technology that we can use to help us. Our navigation is acoustic. It's very accurate. At any given moment down there, something could happen or you could find something totally new. You could stumble into, like I said, you've got the wily coyote rocks above your head. So the best thing to do is go slow, keep your eyes open, and don't believe that you can't screw up because you can. How how do you can you hear me? Yep. How how do you handle uh, claustrophobic problems that this is not be evident? So claustrophobia. You know the good thing about claustrophobia is it happens on deck. <laughs> and most people who have any inkling of claustrophobia won't even get in. And what's interesting is most of those people know full well they're never getting there. They're like, uh uh, I'm not getting in there. We had a girl on board a cruise that was claustrophobic big time. She didn't like elevators. She didn't like aircraft. And she wanted to get a dive. And we worked with her for the better part of that cruise. Her name was Jessica Sharkey. That's really her name. <laughs> now that that song is out, it's in my head. Um, she worked the whole cruise practicing in the sub on deck with our pilots and finally did a dive. She did the whole dive. And we were ready for whether or not she would have to come back. She didn't. She got out. Of course, everybody. I asked her what she thought of the experience. She said she was very glad that she did it and would never do it again. <laughs> but it shows you it's an example where people can overcome their fears and then find out that they had a pretty amazing experience. But most people that are claustrophobic forget about it. They won't even get in. If we were on a dive and we had someone that had a problem, we'd go home. We'd, we'd just turn around and go the other way. We wouldn't have any choice. But I've never had that happen. I've never. Like I said, I've had plenty of people who take one look at it and they're like, I don't even want to get in. <laughs> Not a chance. Great. Well, thank you, Bruce. We appreciate it. <laughs> thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you to the Flying Bridge. Bruce will be around for a little bit afterwards if you have any more questions. Thank you. <laughs>